Fitness Pro Mentor community, welcome to another episode of the Minds on Muscle show. We are your resource for personal training, business development, and education, and we're super excited because today, Glenn is back from traveling all over the world in his hot air balloon with his wife and finally made it back. Wind was not good, so the hot air balloon didn't take exactly the amount of time it should have, but now he's here, and we're going to be talking about something he's really excited about, interpreting knowledge, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Welcome back, by the way. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to be back. 10 days away from home is the right amount of time for me to go on vacation. I think any more than that, and it just throws me out of my my flow, so to speak. Yeah, I'm with you. 10 was really, really good. Uh, Our flight, as I told Brandon, our flight got canceled two days in a row. So it it left me some time to think, which is actually how this podcast episode came to be. I'm really, really excited to talk about it. But yeah, the trip was great. Um, Had some great time meeting some of my family from Italy that I've never met on my wife's side. And I'm excited to talk to people today about knowledge, Brandon. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. I'm excited. So if anybody's listening, please jump in, say hello, tell us where you're from. Really excited to have you here. But today, uh, Glenn, let's jump right into it. Brass tacks, interpreting knowledge, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. So the way this came about was uh, flying back from Italy. It's an almost 10 hour flight. It's 945, uh, 10 hours, depending on the wind and, and all that kind of stuff. And I had some books on my Kindle lined up. And for whatever reason, this book called The 48 uh, Laws of Power was on my mind. And I had bought it years ago. And I had initially started reading it. And I got turned off from it because the way the book is written and the way the laws of power are phrased is almost to me like a a malevolent kind of deceitful conniving way. The first chapter is something like, you know, never usurp the master. And and all the examples in the book are taken from like 1500s, 1400s, 1600s Europe and Italy where people like Machiavelli, um, who was a famous courtesan of the time, uh, was using these kind of psychological or manipulative techniques in order to be the, the cock of the walk, so to speak. Very similar to, I guess, a Game of Thrones kind of stuff, right? People constantly backstabbing each other and taking advantage of each other, trying to usurp each other with power. And so I'm there and I'm like, I want to read this book a little bit because I heard some good things about it from, from one of my friends that is a really good guy. And he works uh, managing people at a, at a tech company, a big tech company in Toronto. And I wanted to see what he got out of it. What did he, why was, why did this guy, who to me is a very moral human being, outstanding gentleman, get a lot out of this book that when I look at it, it to me is malevolent and conniving. And, and this, this, as I was reading some different chapters, I, I came to realize that, you know, in this book, there is knowledge and the knowledge is framed in one way contextually but that doesn't mean that the knowledge can't be used in a more moral way or in a way that is ethical and fits in my quote unquote world view. And so there were some, there were some chapters where it was hard to wrap my head around that, I'll be honest with you, but I really had me realize and, f- and think and I guess kind of parse out that knowledge really isn't necessarily inherently good or bad. It doesn't have this moral quality to it. It just is what it is, kind of like facts. And it's the context in which you apply that knowledge that really matters. And I know that we are a marketing and business growth and business development program. And we often talk about technical things that revolve around marketing. But big picture, I think a lot of things that I see, a lot of times I see with students or I see with just people actually out in the woods, whether trainers that I talk to, is that I don't want to do this thing because I think it's X, Y, Z thing. I don't want to do this on social media because it doesn't fit within X, Y, Z morals of mine, which I get and I understand. But there is a way, I think, to take knowledge and learn from anybody and anywhere and apply that to your business and growth. And I really do mean that. Whether An extreme example of this, then I'd love to hear your thoughts, would be like almost like the political aisle of things. Right now, we're not here talking about politics on this podcast. It's not what we do, but it's a great example in that, especially in the States, you have, you're either like team, uh, team Democrat or team Republican. And it's very hard to see anything admirable about the other side if you're on like the far ends of those two spectrums. However, I think even if you are 
somebody on one side of the aisle, you can still take things from the other side. Let's give you an example. Please, this, when you're listening to this, is just an example. I don't have any affiliation with any political party in the States at all, but there's a lot of people who don't like Donald Trump. He's a really polarizing character. And if you said to someone, name one good thing that you could say about Donald Trump, people say, I couldn't say any good things about him. And one of the things I can look at him and say, well, I think Donald Trump is a master of psychology and a master manipulator. I think you look at him and you can say he understands how human beings think and he was able to, to take advantage of that and play to that, string that knowledge of his in order to have him essentially become the president of the United States of America. Now, whether you agree with his policies, the way he acts or anything like that is not the point of this um, example. The point is that you can take a look at people and see, okay, in their knowledge base, here's what they know and they're really good at executing on, how might I be able to do that? I don't ever want to connive anybody or to trick anybody into training with me. That's, in my mind, morally wrong. But if I can understand the psychology of people and I can understand how people think, I can then show them through our conversation how I can help them and then leave the final choice up to them. If I understand how people think and use the right words to speak to them and really understand how they act on their level, I can speak to them on their level and I can use that psychological know-how in order to help them make the best decision. Maybe they want to work with me, maybe they don't. That's fine. I don't want to force anyone in there. I want to give them every opportunity to say no. However, I also know that if I can show them how I can help them and talk to them at their level, there's a much greater opportunity for me to potentially work with them in a very moral way. So that's where this idea of knowledge isn't good or bad or, or ugly, it just is what it is. And however you interpret it and use it in the context of your own moral, ethical, but also technical framework of personal training is really what it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something really cool about this because truthfully, I mean, I think every piece of information, everything that you learn has an opportunity to interpret. I mean, as a working personal trainer, there's not one world of knowledge that I've personally explored that hasn't had some sort of pragmatic application to what I do in my personal training business. I mean, even, I'm trying to think about all the, but if you take all the worlds of things that you're interested in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you take, and bear with me, and I don't know if this is true or not, but you used to, you used to like gaming. Yeah. Right? You work on still gaming, do. right? You still play games, right? Yeah. You play games and there's a component of creativity within this, right? There's also mm -hmm. like if you're building worlds, you have to think about, okay, well, how do I want to build this world strategically that each thing works together in one emergent behavior? Then there's reaction time, right? How quickly can you react to someone attacking your village or whatever type of game you're playing, right? Then there's improvisation. Then there's also how do you create allies and communicate with people? Right. This is a very far-fetched example, but this is where I think like everything that you do is an opportunity to become a tool extrapolator where you can take pieces of information and apply it to whatever it is that you do. The more I learn about investing and retirement saving, I learn about compound interest, RRSPs, and how these all stack and modify taxes and all this kind of fun stuff. Well, if you are thinking about that kind of stuff, you can also think about, okay, from as a personal training perspective, how does that affect my income? How much money do I need to make? Forget about that. The concepts that we learn about compound interest or whatever it is, that immediately applies to really great stories that you can tell clients about their results. Hey, quickly, right now, you might not expect to see $1 gain off your $100 tomorrow, but over time, we're going to see it grow. And then each year, right? So every, I think there's an opportunity to learn yeah. from everything. And you're talking about like religious parties, like, sorry, religious, pardon me. Um, Political? Political parties. I mean, regardless what we're really doing is we're learning about people's belief systems, mm -hmm. knowledge and information. And we have two sides of the coin that we have as trainers and professionals and people in general. We have the quantitative, quantitative side of things where someone lays down some facts and there are numbers and it's hard proof science. And we have to learn, we have to work with that and become knowledgeable enough to understand it. Then there's the qualitative side of it. Okay, the, these numbers that I learned about when someone applies force into something and X, Y, and Z results happen or whatever it is, how am I interpreting that information and how can I apply it within my world? And there are quantitative ways to apply it and then there's kind of creative creative ways. So I love it, man. I think this is a super great thing. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's so important that we, I think, recognize that because one of the things that I'll, I'll speak for myself and I think this applies to most personal trainers, most people actually, regardless of what profession they're in, and that's the idea that we are who we are and how I see my worldview is my worldview, and I will instantly discard things that don't fit into it. 
and I will uh, continue to pursue things that do. And like openly, I think that is such a, we've talked about positive constraints on this podcast before, right? Like a, a, great, a great example of positive constraints is if you have an hour long session with a client, you have to be able to give them the most bang for their buck in an hour. You've got a positive constraint there. You don't have half an hour, you don't have an hour and a half. So what do we do that's gonna be the most value to them in an hour? That's a positive constraint. There are negative constraints as well. The opposite side of that, which is, what thoughts and beliefs do you have that are stopping you from moving forward? A great example of this would be uh, speech and the way we speak to people and the way we talk. You know, most people never give any thought to how they articulate things and how they talk in day-to-day -day life with the people that are around them until they get into some kind of sales program or it becomes one of those things where they, they have to change the way they're speaking or talking because it's having some kind of serious deleterious effect on their life, right? A great example would be like a relationship. Like you can't just say what you want all the time in every relationship, otherwise you're gonna get burned, right? You have to speak to people and have like, it's a dance, so to speak. Um, but what I'm really trying to say is, is that there is knowledge and information out there, sorry, um, back to this example about uh, speaking. You know, I naturally, right, naturally speak very, very quickly, very, very fast. I slur my words sometimes and I can be loud. And Brandon can attest to this, right? Even when we started this podcast, I would say that was more my default mode of speaking and talking. And then going through and doing this, I become more able to slow down, to articulate when I need to, speak higher and emphasize things when I need to, or be very quiet and use strategic pauses as I need to, to deliver information. And so the reason I say this is because most people aren't gonna give credence to that. That's one of the things I got from that public speaking program I told you about, right? Most people, if you look at a piano, they have one octave they're speaking at in their day-to-day -day life. There's maybe eight to 12 keys that they push down, but they haven't experienced the rest of that piano, the other, I don't know if it's 77 or 88 keys, but it's the piano they have available to them. It'd be like for you in drumming, only really only using part of your drum set to create the beats and the melodies that you do versus using everything to your disposal. And so most people, I think, when they're going out and learning about knowledge, I didn't say most people, some people, when they're going out and learning and they're taking more information, they aren't approaching necessarily with what can I learn? Am I open to having what I know right now be incorrect, have my thoughts challenged to pick up something new and totally do things differently and apply myself differently? I think a lot of people get stuck in this is who I am, this is how I talk, this is what I know it'll always be like this, and they either don't take new actions, they don't change the way they think, they don't change the way they go about their day-to-day -day life, and as a result of that, they find themselves in what? The same place over and over and over again. I, I think some people like that uh, are unaware that they're oh, stuck. Fair. I think that's the bigger problem, I mean, in my opinion. No, I but get there's it. many people who are, are, I would agree, 100 percent that are stuck in a pattern, in a cycle, mm -hmm. but they're, uh, they are unaware that they're stuck in that cycle. And I think that the real struggle, I mean, where I get frustrated when I try to help people who are asking for help, that they're in that cycle, they don't realize they're in the cycle, they're doing the same things over and over again. They're getting frustrated, but they don't have the foresight to see, okay, I'm doing the exact same over and over again. How can I mm. expect to ever see something different? And then you try to interject a book or an idea or a knowledge or a perspective that would help to shift their gear and then they're resistant to it. Mm. And then all of a sudden, they're starting to become more aware that there's an opportunity for them to make a behavior. They're becoming aware of it, but they don't, they're resistant to change. Yeah, uh, I mean, it gets, it gets kind of deep. You know what, I would take that same idea and apply that to the concept of, there's like this general knowledge, like soft knowledge, and then there's like hard technical knowledge, right? Like hard skills and soft skills we talk about in personal training. Hard skills are like the technical things that you know that when you work with people, soft skills are like the communication, business acumen, those kind of things. I would take what you said a step further. This is my own thoughts now. I would say, I think there are times where people are very aware in certain aspects of their lives but maybe completely oblivious and unaware in other aspects. And their, their ability to bring more awareness to certain things isn't as readily easy for them as to bring that awareness to other things. So like, I guess to give you an example, like for me, when I, when I game, like my hour or two a week, sometimes three or four, or sometimes you know, full Sundays if I'm being honest, if I just need to deload, I'm not really that aware of what, I'm not trying to improve, I'm not trying to get, make myself better, I'm not, and I just get stuck in the same place and I'm okay with that. Um, and maybe I'm aware of that sometimes, or maybe I'm unaware of that. But like in business, for example, I am so aware that there's so many things I can learn and grow from that I, I'm far more open to that, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. I think politics is another great example of that, right? Some people are just so stuck in like, 
I believe in this, this one thing, that's the thing, and I can't possibly take another information that might be better or might actually be more correct in my knowledge pool because I dislike where it's coming from or whatever that source might be. So I would say, yeah, I think there are people who are probably just unaware, like they don't know what they don't know sort of thing, but then I would say that I don't know what I don't know also probably exists in different realms of our life and probably is far easier for us to move forward in things that we enjoy and that we're really passionate about rather than things that we're not so passionate about we don't care as much about. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think there's a really cool thing here. Um, this is where, I mean, you know, interpreting knowledge. This is where I like in trying to interpret art because with art in any form, if you pick music, painting, um, uh, really any form, there are no rules. There are no boundaries, which is very cool because the entire thing becomes an interpretive experience. In fact, there are entire industries of people who make tons of money off of creating art that is interpreted in a way that's favorable to an extremely small demographic, which is beautiful because if we take that wording I just said, that comes back down to business, right? You read an incredible book with very polarizing laws that could be extremely negative and unpleasant and not make you feel good. But then you take a step back and realize where they were coming from centuries ago and we can look at, well, how would these rules apply to today? And what am I hearing when I hear these things? And how can I make changes to go forward? This is where, I mean, in my opinion, there's a lot of really not high quality information in the exercise landscape, personal training world so much. But I'm open to hearing all of it because there's even some people that have very bad, dangerous perspectives on how they think about exercise. And I get little nuggets from them like, this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think there's a great exercise if you want to apply this to personal training. And this is from my late mentor, Peter Chason, right? If someone says, hey, go on the floor and create an exercise experience. Right? Super broad, open. Like, hey, go make an exercise experience. What does that even mean? Right? That's such a, a broad view. It's like saying, hey, go create art. But if someone says, okay, Glenn, go down the gym floor, create a multi-joint leg exercise for someone that has a hip replacement and has discomfort past 90 degrees into hip flexion, go. Suddenly we've created limitations with the knowledge that we have, that we have to focus, and now we get to look at that very small piece of information we have and how can we extrapolate that and blow that up. And this is what I love about knowledge, is that you get a one sentence and one philosophy, one piece of information. The question is, okay, how could you take that one piece of information, look at it as a, as a limitation, and then explode it up to something bigger? And I think there's something really beautiful about that, because you can take something tiny and blow it up into an incredible piece of information that opens up your eyes in a major way. Well, I mean, and, th and this is where I think the whole idea of like, no at the end of the day, knowledge is always going to be about how you interpret it. There's always going to be facts out in the world and data, but the facts and data are only as good as your ability to interpret it and apply it to whatever situation you are in. And so it's important to, I mean, and I think I learned this concept from RTS and I really like it, like the idea of lab time. Like you have to have time put aside to, to apply these things. And this is one of the big criticisms of people who are lifetime scholars is they go to university, they learn and study, they get their master's, they get their PhD, then they teach. But then if you don't have that real world experience, how far are you able to really take that knowledge for the people that you're learning from? You really want to give it to them at like the most like technical tacit level rather than actually from a place of lived experience, which is important. I, I, if I was to go to university and go to a business course, I would hope that for whatever reason, the professor that's teaching me is someone who's actually established multiple businesses in the past, has done very well, and then just teaches as in retirement in their later years because it, it brings them joy to bring that on. But I feel like that's far and few, but few and far between because I know people who are very driven in the business world. You are one of them. And I'm not going to say this is you, but I put myself in your shoes. The thrill of just growing a business and then changing the world is such a wonderful, amazing feeling, I think, for you that it, it's hard to want to step back and then just say, well, I'm going to stop working on my businesses and just go teach this stuff to people. Instead, it's like, let me create FPM and teach as much as I can, right? So you are kind of doing that. But I think there's something to be said for like, I mean, you, you, you and I both have clients with multi-million dollar businesses. You've talked about in the class, you've got clients who are close to the billion dollar mark. And those people are so enamored with the business growth thing. I think the idea of teaching is probably not something that's really crossed their mind that much, if at all. 
Maybe diff- mentoring one on one here or there, but it's different for each person for sure. sure. But it's funny. So I went to business school. And I went to school for general business to figure out which specialty I wanted to. And I switched to marketing because of all the teachers I had, they all were people who did not do business. <laughs> and they were teaching, except for the marketing instructor. And he was someone that worked for Coca-Cola and all these people. And he pulled up in a bright red convertible Corvette that was brand new this year, uh, the year that I was in school. And he was just like awesome. He was like this guy. He was like, listen, honestly, guys, I, I made the money that I need to to live. I do this because I want to help people like you be better at marketing. And I was like, this guy is like awesome. And he was the best teacher. And that's what got me excited about marketing because he was actually someone who actually did it. Yeah. And anyway, yeah. No, I mean, I get it, right? So I mean, there's, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I, I think really what this comes down to is like, there's knowledge out there everywhere and you can learn from almost anyone. And yes, do you have to pick your mentors or where you're getting your knowledge from in a deliberate manner? Absolutely, for sure. I suppose what I'm encouraging everyone who's listening to do would be to, When you have those moments of this is going to be useless or this doesn't apply to me or this doesn't work for me, you might be right. You may be correct. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I am saying take a moment, put on your uh, openness cap and listen for just a few more minutes and see, does this make sense for me to pursue or not? Because I think at least for me, I can say now that I'm rereading this book, actually I should say rereading, reading for the first time after reading one or two chapters and being like, I don't know, this doesn't sound very ethical to me. I'm going back through and reading this 48 Laws of Power, and I'm like, okay, I would never do things this way, the way they have done it in the 1500s in this Machiavellian court, but I can certainly see how some of these things would apply to me in day-to-day life in a way that, to me, is, is moral and ethical, which is really important to me. Cool, guys. Well, I think this is a great episode. Thanks so yeah. much for uh, instigating this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think I think it's once in a while it's nice to step outside the realm of like everything very hard technical training. So talk about how it applies, but still think about like how can we think differently? Because for me, I think that if we if we all could think like Jeff Bezos, we'd all we all could potentially be billionaires, right? So if we can all think a little bit differently, I think we'll all be able to help more people make more money, and all live our lives in a more happy, more fulfilled way. I think ultimately that's why you and I do what we do here is because we, we want to do that for ourselves. We enjoy doing this, and we want to be able to help the people who are listening do that as well. I love it. No, that was that's yeah, great. Me too. So I'm going to throw my pick of the weekend to give you a minute to think about yours. Well, I already, mine's going to be the book, but we'll talk about it. You can do yours. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, all, my pick of the week for this week is I want you all, and it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a behavior thing. Pick one thing you do each week or should do each week that's difficult and do everything you can to make it as easy and as simple as possible. One of my favorite things that I would say leader, busy entrepreneur people I see do, and I try to do this myself, is I like taking hard things and making them easy. How do you make editing videos, right? This idea of something that should take, could take five to 10 hours a week and make it as simple as possible. I don't mean, I don't mean skip steps. I don't mean make like skip steps with the quality diminishes, but how do you do the same high quality, amazing thing as efficiently and as simply as possible? Make it so easy for you that you can stack more things because if you can stack multiple dull, dark, hard things into your skill set to help you grow, you can do so much more, so much faster. And I think it's one of my favorite things is how do you take difficult things and make them easy so you can move on to the next thing. It's almost like systematizing things is helpful. Hmm, interesting. And Glenn's pick is the book. <laughs> So 48 laws of power, yes. And the reason I'm picking this and the reason I'm challenging everyone to, if they've got the time and they feel like it makes sense for them to go in and read it, is because you will have to challenge your ethical, moral mindset to get through some of this stuff. There have been some absolute gems in there, which I really, really liked. I'm going to give you a quick example one. One of the, uh, one of the I forget the actual name of the law, but it's something to the extent of like uh, see yourself and treat yourself like royalty. And it's this whole idea that if you have high self-esteem and you're confident and you treat yourself like royalty and you have charisma, those around you will respect you and treat you that way as well, even if you don't necessarily deserve it. And the example they actually give is Christopher Columbus. And so Christopher Columbus fabricated that he was nobility in Portugal, that he came from a wealthy bloodline. The truth is his father was like a quilt maker. And he was able to, by having this high level of charisma and confidence in himself and, and act like royalty, essentially weasel himself into marrying into a rich family and then eventually convincing royalty to fund his trips to Asia where he subsequently discovered, right, discovered at least to Western Europe, um, North America, so to speak, right? That's Christopher Columbus's big claim. But they talk about and they discuss and they share in this book is that 
the whole idea is that he just had really high self-esteem and he had high regard and he acted such. Now, would I go out there and lie to people and tell people that I came from a noble, noble wealthy family? That's not for me. I wouldn't do that. That's kind of where that, that kind of Machiavellian malevolence kind of comes in there. But do I think there's something in holding yourself in high self-esteem and walking around with confidence and charisma, not belittling people, not making people feel wrong, but respecting yourself so that people treat you through respect? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful way to go in the world. And so that was one of the small things I learned, but I had to step back from the framework of the book and put it into my own framework. And I think that there is a, there is a skill or a learning in that of in itself. Can you look at a source of information disregard what it is, but take it into your own context and find a way to make it work for you in a way that is more and ethical for yourself and is going to benefit you and those around you. I think that's amazing. So I do recommend the 48 Laws of Power. Interesting, I don't know if you know this, you can now get e spot books on Spotify, audio books on Spotify. Didn't know that. Very if you cool. go to Spotify, they are now increasing their collection. So I actually got the book on Spotify instead of having to have Audible and this and credits. I can cool, now just get cool. it on Spotify and download and have it on your app. So very cool. Streamline. Anyways. That's my pick of the week. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for being here with the Fitness Pro Mentors podcast, the Minds on Muscle show. We'll be back in two weeks in another special episode. And I got a training on post-activation potentiation stuff that I'm going to be doing for everybody in the Facebook group real soon. So if you're listening to this on Spotify, go Fitness Pro Mentors Facebook group. We'd love to see you there. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Take care, everybody.